Good evening, everyone. I am Lauren Gates, your host of this evening's special Airway Health Solutions Conversation Series. I am so thrilled to have you here tonight. This is such an important topic. I mean, sleep apnea, you can't go to a party, you can't go to a function, you can't really escape it. It's everywhere. And there's so much confusion and complexity around it. So I'm so grateful for you taking the time tonight to really help to unpack that. And we're going to do that with an overview of the five reasons to treat. Um, but I really want to also see who's with us tonight because we had over 200 registered. I know a lot of people couldn't make it live tonight, but I always like to get a feel um, from the audience of who we're with. So I'm going to go ahead and, and launch a poll here and see who's joining us tonight. And I tried to get as many descriptions as I could, but if you could please choose the description of your profession that best describes you, it's always nice to kind of get a feel of who's with us tonight. I'll just give it a couple more minutes. While we're we, doing this got, poll, got... I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this disclaimer because it's always such a pain in the neck and we lost a couple of minutes. So um, yeah. maybe when people come in, they can still take the poll. But I just need to give a couple of disclaimers um, just for legal purposes. The views presented are the opinions of our speaker and not necessarily affiliated with Lauren Gates and Associates and Airway Health Solutions. And the following webinar is provided for educational informational purposes only and does not constitute providing medical advice or professional services. The information provided should not be used for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease. And those seeking personal medical advice should consult with a licensed physician or dentist. Always seek the advice of your doctor or other qualified health providers regarding a medical or dental condition. Some housekeeping items is to receive your CE certificate. It's a dental CE we offer. You must be in attendance for the entire program. Uh, Zoom software tracks the attendance, so we do not need to give you a code or a survey at the end of our pre presentation. I'm really excited that we're gonna hold a live digital raffle where we're gonna give two prizes because it's the holiday spirit tonight. Um, Dr. McCarty, thank you so much for be be by being so generous to offer your beautiful- well, I'm, look I'm looking beautiful for my book. copy and I, I can't- yeah, I Hold can't. on. I, I I have one here. Oh, <laughs> great, great. Empowered sleep apnea. Yep. It's a beautiful blue book that everyone should have this in their office. I don't care if you're my functional office, uh, physical therapist. It is a beautiful book geared towards patients to understand the complexity of sleep apnea so they can have the empowerment that they need to get the treatment that they deserve. It's really um, a, a must have. And thank you so much for donating a signed copy of that tonight. At yeah, the you'll end. get you'll get a, it's going to be signed and there's going to be a cartoon in there and everything. So uh, you know, it's straight, straight from the empowered sleep apnea yeah, and also the, the circadian rhythm the rhythm wheel right yep yeah circadian rhythm wheels <laughs> okay. that, for sure all right let's let's see who's with us tonight so um here we go we have a lot of a lot of dentists and dental hygienists i think they're the top and then um a, a lot of other you know us uh, other professions, OMT, SLP, um, orthodontists are in the house, periodontists are in the house, the other healthcare professionals. I'm sorry if you want to chat what they are. We would love to welcome you as well. Um, pediatric dentists. So welcome, everybody. I'll, there is the results. So um, the other question I want to ask everybody, because I'm just curious about everybody's uh, level of, of knowledge with sleep apnea. So I think that I may have this question here. Stop sharing. Okay. The only question we have tonight, I have to work on my poll, my poll taking <laughs> uh, expertise here. But well, I really want to just dive in here and give you a somewhat of a formal, but not too formal um, introduction, because I literally printed out his CV and I ran out of paper and ink. I'm not kidding. It's like about 22 pages. So I just want our audience to get to know you. A lot of people aren't familiar perhaps with you because it's more from the dental side and you are a medical doctor. But let me go ahead and just read a little bit about you and then we'll discuss a little bit about your journey into sleep medicine. Sure, so sure. Dr. Dave McCarty is a board certified specialist in sleep medicine and a pioneer in the practice of patient-centered care for those who suffer from sleep disorders. An award-winning educator, he is passionate about empowering individuals with knowledge that restores confidence and personal agency as each patient navigates the landscape of disease and wellness within an increasingly fragmented healthcare system. He is the co-creator of Empowered Sleep Apnea, 
uh, you can visit empoweredsleepapnea.com. It's an innovative cross-platform educational project combining storytelling, cartooning, scientific rigor, and quite a bit of fun. That's true. All in the name of helping individuals and providers navigate the fascinating but complex disorder known as sleep apnea. In 2023, the project comprises a website, a book, The Empowered Sleep Apnea, which we'll talk about later, a handbook for patients and the people who care about them, co-authored with Linda Stuth. I want to make sure I pronounce her name right. It's Ellen Stothard. Stothard, thank you. Um, and a podcast, Sleep Empowered Sleep Apnea, the podcast. Uh, Dr. Um, Dr. McCarty is a graduate of Duke University of the School of Medicine. And tell us a little bit about your journey of, of what made you want to become a, ultimately a sleep doctor. Well, I, I started out, I wanted to be Marcus Welby, you know, okay. I, I just knew I wanted to be a doctor. And so I, when I graduated from Duke, I went to Mass General in the internal medicine program uh, and I wanted to be a primary care doc. I wanted to be someone's doctor, you know. And, uh, and so when I graduated from that residency program, my first job was uh, with the United States military. I joined the Air Force because um, I wanted to be sort of part of this team that was delivering this care. And, uh, and it was a great experience. I was at Barksdale Air Force Base for, uh, for three years down there in Shreveport. And it was there that it was because I was trying to manage high blood pressure, basically. Mm -hmm. And they, there's a strong connection between um, uh, untreated sleep apnea and, and difficult to treat high blood pressure. So I found myself in the position of taking responsibility for the blood pressure. The buck stops here, you know. And, uh, and I started sending all kinds of sleep studies based on, you know, newest recommendations. And I realized that this was a this was an interesting problem, and a lot of my patients had trouble with the treatment, and so they ended up not going back to their sleep provider. So I ended up trying to figure out what to do with them, and in that process, I ended up buying a a, a textbook called Principles and Practice of Sleep Medicine. Uh, it was mm -hmm. then in its third edition, I believe, and I, I read that book cover to cover, and I realized, wow. <laughs> complex right that's what oh my goodness <laughs> this overlaps into everything yeah. that i do and yeah. so that that was when i decided to sort of go back and cross train and i, I did sort of a, a, a form an informal apprenticeship style fellowship with dr andrew chesson at lsu shreveport and uh, dr chesson is a past president of the aasm and really a world-class physician and, uh, and he sort of took me on as an unpaid fellow, which I, I did this for two years, kind of followed him around. And, uh, and at the end of it, he asked me to join the faculty. So I ended up in an academic program, which I, I, I helped sort of get the program accredited. And then uh, later on, I, I took over the directorship when, when Dr. Chesson retired. So it was, a, it was a really interesting doorway into a whole new world. But the point is, I brought my primary care heart with me, you know, um, all of these mm -hmm. people needed integration of all of this stuff. So I've, I've always sort of approached this problem with that lens of, I want to be this person's doctor, you know, not just this person's, you know, prescription stamper, or like, you know, I'm giving you this treatment, because this is the part that I understand. I, I've always been trying to help the patient find uh, some sort of wholeness there, you know. Well, that's why we're thrilled to announce. I'm just going to go ahead and announce it because I can barely barely hold and contain my excitement is that we're having you on the Airway Health Solutions faculty. Yay, because Yay. we need someone like you to this missing piece of the puzzle of we're all trying to prevent sleep apnea and, you know, and, and help from the dental point of view. But what is it? I mean, it's so complex and it's such a monster that we're so excited that we're going to launch a course on sleep apnea. We'll talk about that a little bit more in detail because we're just sure. going to give an overview tonight, but that'll be February 24th and we couldn't be really more thrilled to have you um dr yeah. mccarty on board and you just you're a wonderful addition and part of the team so welcome i'm delighted and and yeah this is a, definitely a sneak preview of what's going to happen in february this is all what i consider to be the language of empowerment and that's not just empowering our patients that's empowering ourselves to talk about these degrees of complexity and with with language that we all can share so that we can kind of step away from these kind of limited understandings and and, and get how it all fits together you know, so I'm Wonderful. thrilled to be able to share this with y'all. This is great fun. Well, everyone's in for a treat tonight. So thank you for your time. And I'm going to go ahead and have you take the wheel and uh, okay. let's go into the um, five reasons to treat. Let's do it. I'm going to share a screen now. And uh, if I can figure out how to do it again, here we go. All right. Can we all see this screen? 
You're good. All right. We're carrying forward. This is called the five reasons to treat. Uh, and this is my patient-centered collaborative deconstruction of the why of sleep apnea. So we are living, folks, in the future. And if you need proof of this, just ask chat GPT. So it's now possible that we can order a validated sleep test over the internet. You can get tested for sleep apnea in your own home, and you can get labeled with sleep apnea quite conveniently, virtually overnight. We are here. So here's the issue, though. All these labels are about to be dispensed. Sleep apnea has many, many moving parts. We zoom out, sleep apnea, well, obstructive sleep apnea coexists with varying degrees of central sleep apnea. It always does. Sleep apnea may or may not cause symptoms. It may or may not be associated with snoring. It may or may not cause oxygen desaturations. The symptoms of, that it can cause are highly variable and nonspecific. Specific treatments may or may not even work. In a word, the navigational world of sleep apnea is complex, and a patient's journey is likely to involve multiple silos of thought. We're zooming out again. So if that was where sleep apnea was, sleep apnea overlaps and intersects with a thousand and one other stressors that might damage the perceived sleep-wake experience. So just because somebody sleeps poorly doesn't mean that treating that sleep apnea more aggressively is going to improve that experience, okay? So the usual suspect, in other words, may not be totally responsible for what's wrong. Okay, I'm getting things on my phone, and that's not Lauren, so I'm okay. I can keep talking. <laughs> so it brings me to one of my words of the year, okay? The word is complexity. Complexity is something that people actually study, you know? I didn't know this, but they study how to manage it and how to make sense of it. So complexity is different from the merely complicated. Complicated is the cockpit of a 747, you know? I certainly couldn't make sense of it, but the point is that the dials and gauges are knowable, okay? With proper training, you can get a predictable result. Complexity implies something more vast, obscure, you know? Complexity is a Brazilian rainforest. In order to make sense of complexity, it has to be explored during the course of problem solving. And the hubris of directionality and purpose leads to disasters of mosquito coast proportions. Now, unpacking complexity means managing the disassembly process, you know, it means managing that responsibly, using a, a shared language that's portable which means that it's expected that this patient's journey may cross silos of thought. So we have to unpack the complexity in a way that acknowledges that our silo may not have all the answers. So on the, on the journey of the Empowered Sleep Apnea Project, which basically started just over a year ago with the publication of our book and our first podcast episode going live in September, 2022, on this journey, one of the most magnificent words I've picked up along the way is this one. It's called co-discovery. And I learned this word from Dr. Paul Henney, who made it his life's work to capture the essence of a legendary dentist by the name of Bob Barkley. And Dr. Barkley saw this connection. This was back in the 70s. He saw the connection between oral health and medical disease. And he had just written a definitive text on the relationship-based health-centered dentistry. He was riding on this meteoric rise to greatness when he literally died just like Buddy Holly at the height of his power in a fiery plane crash. Co-discovery, the clinical process involves collaborative decision-making. It requires a shared language of this complexity. Now, textbooks about sleep medicine provide compendiums of different disease labels, different diagnoses, how they're separated into categories. And providers have to adjust their thinking and their process to this purpose of assigning these labels. And the problem here is that the label can take on a life of its own. So as providers, our challenge at this phase of the co-discovery process is to help our patients find language to describe their own narrative. You know, we have to help them preserve it because the system, it's nobody's fault, but the system's kind of set up to take it away from them. The language is vital when the attention turns to the discussion about treatment because the language establishes the why of our treatment. Forward, there we go. Now, the five reasons to treat coffee hut discussion. This is the, some of the friendly language of our, of our project. The Five Reasons Monument is a place on our fictional island. You'll get to see the whole island in a minute. But it's a testament to the permanence of this idea. There are always five reasons to treat that should be discussed. This is permanent. 
And once you see this applies to every single patient and it's a nice way to break it apart. But the coffee hut, this is a different place. This is a headspace where the event should recognize this discussion should not be coercive. It should not feel threatening or scary. It should be easy and accessible and unpressured and above all patient-centered. Now there's some prerequisite knowledge that has to happen when we're talking about the five reasons uh, to treat. And that prerequisite discussion happens in what I consider to be the Bay of narrative. This is the loading zone. Okay. Um, what we talk about is how we uh, talk about narrative. And then we discuss an understanding of the jargon contributing to this notorious metric that we all understand. We think we know that co that's called the AHI. There is a lot to unpack with that metric. So in the Bay of narrative, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to help the patient establish and preserve their narrative. We're going to help the patient understand and then engage their engineering mind about the many moving parts of sleep apnea. We're gonna see there's more than one. We're gonna talk about how events are scored because this jargon is important when we start to unpack the AHI. All of this is going to be of foundational importance when we get to the coffee hut and we actually talk about the five reasons to treat. So sleep satisfaction is a great place to start. And this is a scene from an iconic movie from my youth. This is the great Bo Derek and Dudley Moore in a movie called 10. It's a rating scale that everyone understands. Everyone knows what a perfect 10 is. A great place to start the conversation is to prompt the patient to set the stakes. I like to start with a simple question. I frame it like this. Think about your sleep, all that it does for you. Think about the night, how it goes. Think about how you do in the daytime, pertinent to the sleep at night, whether you feel rested, energized, whether something less than that. With all that in mind, are you satisfied? If it stayed like this forever, is that okay? Yes or no? And then when they give you a yes, and you say, so you fall asleep easily and you sleep through the night and you wake up refreshed and restored and you're not tired in the day. See what they say. You know, people are defensive about this because they don't want to be sold a treatment they don't want. They already feel like the fuller brush salesman is at the door. So give them a chance to talk. Now, if they say I'm not satisfied, if they say they are satisfied, you can help them clarify But let's give it a number, scale of one to 10, you know, 10 out of 10, like the great Miss Bo Derek is perfect. You really can't imagine it could get better. One out of 10 is you can't imagine this could be worse. All this is, this is not a validated scale. This is an exercise in empathy. The lower the score, the more that person is suffering, okay? The lower the score, the more attention you got to pay to the patient's perception of where that suffering is coming from, because that's leading you to why we're doing something about this. It may lead you in a different direction. Okay, I'm going to begin our journey in a place where we often do begin the journey with our patients after some sim some diagnostic studies done, you know, after a number or a label has been assigned and the patient has washed up on a foreign island with its own culture, rituals and responsibilities. We're going to help our patients co-discover their own narrative here in the Bay of Narrative. So right now, this is what we know. So Kate, she's 22. We know she's tired all the time. She has, quote, chronic insomnia, and her AHI on her study was three per hour. Now there's Sophia, 72 years old. We know she sleeps poorly. That's what she says. She's up to the bathroom all night. Her AHI is 44. So sleep apnea, you know, what is it anyway? Does Kate have it? Does Sophia have it? To answer this question, we're going to have to zoom out. Talk about some jargon. So we know where that metric of frustration, the AHI comes from. We'll see that there's a lot that gets lost in translation. For starters, let's talk about terms. So sleep apnea means that the pattern of breathing during sleep is not stable. So there are two basic reasons why this can happen. Obstructive sleep apnea can be thought of, I can't breathe. The airway's blocked or partially blocked for several breath attempts, and then it recovers, okay? So you get physiologic stress from this phenomenon, sleep fragmentation, restriction, intermittent hypoxia sometimes, transthoracic pressure shifts from <gasps> trying to breathe against a closed airway, that does funny things, vibrational trauma due to the snoring, systemic and local inflammation, and sympathetic stimulation, okay? Central sleep apnea is a completely different beast. This is more like a won't breathe. The effort to breathe is unstable. It waxes and wanes. You know, recovery breathing is kind of like a heavy sigh, okay, which produces a subsequent pause. We do this during the day. 
Physiologic stress here is not the same as OSA. Yes, you might get sleep fragmentation and restriction. Yes, you might get intermittent hypoxia, but there's no transthoracic pressure shift. There's usually not vibrational trauma. There's no signal that primary central sleep apnea increases cardiovascular mortality. Okay, so these are different problems, but they always overlap. Okay, this is the problem. And they always coexist. So this is one of my cartoons. It says, Harrigan, dear boy, this is my character, Claudio. I'm having my sleep study tonight. He says, Poggers, Uncle C. Poggers, that's a word. I wonder if you have any events. So this is introducing the idea that you have events that are scored. What kind of events? Like a party? He's like, no. So that'd be awesome. And then all of a sudden it goes south from there. But events, what events? Well, an apnea means that it was an episode of not breathing. Okay, the airflow stopped. There's a hypopnea which is an episode of underbreathing. The airflow was insufficient to do what it's supposed to do. So because of that insufficient flow that was limited, it caused something to happen. So I want to look at these pictures right now. I don't, I don't need you to memorize things. I just need you to understand that this is how it all gets organized. So if we were to think about effort and airflow, we can see that an obstructive apnea is that effort is continuous but airflow is blocked. This is like sucking against a closed airway. Then there's a central apnea. Effort goes away and then recovers, okay? That's a central apnea. We can score mixed apneas. They don't really help in the problem solving because there's always a central component, but a mixed apnea is where you can see that as effort recovers, there's still a flow limitation. Then we get to hypopneas. Hypopneas are partial limitations that produce results. What results? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. A respiratory effort-related arousal or arrhea is just a little bit less of a flow limitation, okay? A little bit less, but it still produces an arousal from sleep. So here's the big problem here, folks. It's here. It's in the hypopnea definition. So the definition for hypopnea has evolved. When we say the term AHI, it's apnea hypopnea index. It's how many of those per hour. The AASM criteria is that there, it, it, this event causes a 3% arousal, a 3% desaturation or an arousal if the flow limitation event is at least 30% from baseline, okay? In 2022, this was the recommended, this is very recent. Now, the, the age-old standard criteria from which we've actually devised our risk idea is based on the 4% desaturation criterion. That means that this flow limitation event causes a 4% drop. Now, here's the problem. Discerning which of these events contributes to the burden of hypopneas is hard. It requires actually specialized equipment to do it completely well. So meaning specifically, and therefore this is considered optional because this specialized equipment is expensive and uncomfortable. So most hypopneas are just reported as hypopneas, not whether they're leaning central or leaning uh, obstructive. And you can see now that if there are elements that contribute to the central hypopnea burden, that's going to contribute to the AHI. That's what this is, discussion is about. Now, the definition of hypopnea had to evolve because folks with normal 4% AHI scores sometimes felt better when they used a CPAP machine. So the 4% criterion was leaving people behind. So the term upper airway resistance syndrome was introduced to satisfy that gap. You know, Now, to help keep the paradigm stable, the AASM changed the definition of hypopnea to allow scoring the event when it caused a 3% desaturation or even a, an arousal, okay? So it theoretically was capturing those non-desaturating cases. So the term upper airway resistance syndrome was therefore retired officially by the AASM. This creates a gap in the language, changing the way complexity is deconstructed in between silos. So rather than kind of have one silo stamp its feet and say they're correct, I find it's helpful to understand that we have a language gap. You know, we have a little bit of a diplomacy problem. What the dentists call UARS is the territory that I would call rear of predominant sleep apnea. UARS has more meaning in some ways because it emphasizes the functional importance of healthy daytime breathing as well. Okay, so there's something lost in that translation, but we need to understand the language gap that, that introduces. 
So when we look at Kate's study, AHI3, we see plenty of stuff that's concerning, okay? Look at these flow limitation events, flow limitation and recovery, flow limitation and recovery, flow limitation and recovery. Look what's happening to oxygen saturations, 89 down to 87. This is not going to get scored as anything on a home sleep apnea test, okay? We can see heart rate is changing with spikes happening in response to these flow limits. These are probably RERAs, okay? They might even be scorable as hypopneas with the uh, 3% or the hypopnea rule, okay? This is a lab that happens to use the 4% rule because that's what's acceptable by most payers, okay? The tail is wagging the dog here, folks. This person has sleep apnea. It's just rear or predominant sleep apnea. Here's the diagnosis. If the symptoms, uh, if there are symptoms like snoring or sleep weight complaints, vulnerable comor com comorbidities like hypertension, the diagnosis is made if the obstructive event rate is greater than five per hour, okay? Ob obstructive events are considered to be apneas, hypopneas, and reras, okay? So if you put them in a the lab and find reras, at least five per hour, if they got symptoms, they've got sleep apnea. Okay, but according to the AASF, if the obstructive event rate is greater than 15 per hour, apneas, hypopneas, and rares, the diagnosis is made regardless of comorbidities or symptoms. That means they can get this label with just a number. Okay, go back to the future is here where you wear a ring and now you've got an AHI of 15. Now you've got this label. What are we going to do? What are we going to tell these people? Should they get treatment? Okay, how do we decode that? This um, study, I'm not going to talk about for very long, but I want to report what it did. This was uh, uh, by a, a pretty reputable group at, at, uh, at Harvard. Um, what they did is they retrospectively looked at sleep studies for perfectly well people, which meant that they screened them for all evidence of medical disease and sleep weight complaints. They were well. They weren't taking any meds. They were normotensive. They were not depressed. This is what they found using a 3% criterion to describe their event rate. So they reported it as an RDI. It's apneas and hypopneas defined by a 3% uh, um, criterion for desaturation. Notice what happens here in the um, group of people who are over 65. The average RDI amongst people who feel perfectly well was 22 per hour. Okay. That gets them the diagnosis of sleep apnea. Greater than 50% of them had an, a, had an RDI greater than 15. And in this context, RDI would be an AHI as defined by the 3% criterion for hypopneas. So, wow, folks, should these people be treated? Why should they be treated? Okay, we don't know. The point here is it doesn't matter which voice is right, which is wrong. Lots of voices are crying out what the patient should do, you know, once you get this label and the patient ends up feeling caught in the crosshair. So this was a cartoon I drew early on in the project trying to capture what our patients were going through. I'm going to go through it phrase by frame by frame because this is, this still instructs me in terms of like what the battle we're fighting is. Why do you have sleep apnea? It says, let's ask around. Well, it's because your anatomic dimensionality is limited by epigenetic influences. What? No, it's because your jaw is too small because you weren't breastfed. You probably didn't chew your food. Well, I can make you something for that. And then here, meanwhile, the medical tribe is saying, oh, it's because you're all obese and you should be ashamed, right? There's you know, shaming in there and you have to use this CPAP and oh my gosh, really? And then all of a sudden you get a different voice saying, nah, it's because your nose, we got to get you breathing through your nose. I can do surgery. And it's like, is this my fault? And he's like, yeah, it's probably your fault. And then next thing you know, somebody says, nah, you need your tonsils out. And somebody else is coming at you with a knife, you know? And then next thing you know, oops, shoot. My slides are moving forward too fast for my brain. Next thing you know, somebody wants to release your tongue. He's pushing somebody else out of the way. And, and finally, your book club neighbor says, oh, my gosh, this, this is the Western medical complex trying to enslave you. And at the end of that journey, here's our patient. You know, this feels so threatening to have everybody distrusting each other and speaking different languages. You know, they feel like they're caught in the crosshairs. So once I kind of realized that this is the battle that we're actually fighting, it led me on a different trajectory of how we're going to talk about this. So it leads me to the discussion of the many moving parts. This is, phrase keeps coming up. I think that the mistakes that we see in, in different silos has to do with the fact that we're unpacking this poorly. Uh, and it's not anybody's fault. It's that we don't know the language because there's many moving parts to this. So let's just talk about them. So the first moving part of sleep apnea, believe it or not, is how twitchy is your brain? You know, um, 
if an event happens, are you going to have an arousal with it? Um, that's dependent on your chronic sympathetic level of stimulation, folks. So that has to do with the chronicity of disease and other factors, including the symptoms that you're having. It has to do with the skull, craniofacial respiratory complex. What's the size and shape of the oral vault? How forward developed is your maxilla? Where is your mandible? All of these things have a functional component too. The nose, nasal airspace patency, and the functional nasal breathing status. Can this patient breathe through their nose, or are they subverting to the um, open mouth breathing status? Mouth, posterior airspace soft tissue, functional tongue status. Where is the tongue sitting? What's the size of the tonsils? What's the functionality and, and, uh, and, and floppiness and, and position of the soft palate? Uh, neck and head position and posture, we're now realizing that the forward head position is a contributor to posterior airway compromise. This is groundbreaking, understanding that posture is related to this problem. Lungs, so the more we age, the more we lose the ability to oxygenate our lungs, okay, oxygenate our blood. Um, every year we go around this sun, we lose some of that capacity. If we're smokers, we lose it like this. If we're non-smokers, it's like this. The older that you get, the more likely it is that these obstructive events are going to cause oxygen desaturations. And then finally, how heavy are we? Visceral adiposity leads to pulmonary non-excursion. Okay? It causes the problems of upper airway uh, collapsibility due to lack of the tracheal tug. As far as central sleep apnea, that's the other flavor. There's all kinds of other things that you can think about, including, well, I, I meant to bring these out one at a time, hypercarbic responsiveness. Now that's the concept of when you drop your oxygen, you're also raising your CO2, okay? It's the, the actual primary trigger to breathe. So when that happens, how twitchy are you? How likely are you to take big gulp gasping breaths? Because that's kind of where your set point is. That's something that I've actually learned on this journey. You can train yourself about. This is what James Nestor taught us about those deep sea divers. What about circulation time? This is the amount of time it takes for blood to make the lap of the, of the circulation. This is something that tends to diminish with age. Okay. So if it takes a long time for the signal to get from the thermostat, uh, from 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 the house all the way to the thermostat to get it back to the furnace, we have a delay and we end up with an unstable system. Again, arousal threshold here. Our set points for breathing are different for sleep and for wake. So if you're having something else waking you up and your arousal threshold is low because your sympathetic activity is chronically high, that's going to lead to an increased propensity for central sleep apnea. People who breathe too fast at baseline, people who are mouth breathers at baseline tend to do this more. And this is something that also happens due to high altitude. This has been a crash course in central sleep apnea physiology. I live at 5,200. I took care of people as high as, as 10,000, and they went back and forth. You learn a lot about what altitude can do. And then finally, pulmonary frailty uh, is a problem here too. The older that you get, the more likely these pauses are to cause actual drops in oxygen, which are going to lead to reactive overventilation events and arousals. Source of periodic arousals is the last thing. Um, if you have another problem that wakes you up from sleep, you will have a higher likelihood of having central sleep apnea. That doesn't mean that you need to push the CPAP for this. That means that you need to think about the other sources of arousals, many moving parts. Okay, so the geographic construct of the aisle of sleep apnea provides structure for the things that are hard to model in a standard textbook, you know, pace, order headspace you know the bay of narrative is supposed to be a meandering place an educational loading zone and that's where we clarify the language of the sleep wake experience that's where we learn about the many moving parts of osa and csa and that's where we learn about all the jargon that goes into the metric of severity that everyone claims to understand that slippery term known as the ahi so this part of the discussion opens the problem up for inspection gets both the provider and the patient thinking about it with an engineer's mind Okay, this is the empowered problem solving mind that starts to imagine different ways one might intervene. It's a shared headspace. Come on now. Okay, so the next question is, should we? Should we do something, anything, many things? You know, should we? There is a moral imperative to the word should, suggesting a weighing of options. Is doing something necessary? Is the financial and physical risk of our intervention really worth it to the patient? How do we co-discover this? So the five reasons to treat paradigm is a complexity sense-making tool that makes this process much easier, okay? The, the why of treatment of sleep apnea is broken down into five 
discussion points. Those points are risk, snoring, sleep, wake, and comorbidities. And every case can be broken down that way. And every patient can understand it. And it should happen before any discussion of treatment. So the five reasons discussion establishes the why. Okay, risk. This is the hardest topic to discuss because the concept of risk is inherently slippery. Like, what does it mean? So in this context, to put it simply, there is signal that sleep apnea can shorten your life, okay? This signal is strongest for disease that's mostly uh, populated, the, the AHI score is mostly populated by the obstructive events, okay? Mostly obstructive apneas and obstructive hypopneas. We'll get to the data in a minute. But proving that a given condition causes harm is not exactly easy. And that's why it took so long to get the tobacco companies to admit to anything. There are always confounders. Okay, real world data is inherently self-selected and you can't control for everything. So you have to use tools. So a population-based prospective cohort study is a really powerful epidemiologic tool for understanding complexity of how diseases work when there's multiple confounders. So the Wisconsin sleep cohort 18 year follow-up study is a pretty darn compelling signal that sleep apnea kills. Now, when you're looking at these data, you are seeing 18 years of follow-up people starting at ground zero with different AHI scores and their survival trajectory. So this is hard data. Did they live or did they die? Okay. This was defined by an AHI with the 4% desaturation criterion. So here's another thing to know. The Wisconsin sleep cohort was performed at sea level in a younger middle-aged population with little baseline heart disease. So their circulation time was normal. Okay, so you should read this as many of the moving parts for the central sleep apnea physiology were turned way down for this. So these numbers that you see on this screen are informed by the obstructive events. Okay, we have to keep this in mind when we're talking to our patients. So let's go back to our cases now. Okay, we've got Kate, 22 year old, tired all the time, AHI three. Let's think about risk for this case. Okay, the 4% AHI was three. The label based trajectory here is to say, well, the study's negative, you know. And then the patient is jettisoned into the nether regions of this UARS that the doctors say they don't believe in. And the dentists are saying, you know, you doctors don't know. And, and the patient feels alien. So the empowered approach is to use what we learned from the many moving parts and translate this number. Her 4% AHI was only three. So, but when we look at the heart rate variability, we see the presence of proper probable RERAs. We could have the set study rescored, you know, using the 3% criterion. We can have her go to the lab and score the RERAs. The empowered approach is to let the patient know that what they have is called, you know, in the medical world, it's called rear predominant sleep apnea, and it's called UARS by the dentist. It's talking about the same thing, okay? The empowered approach would be to say that, yes, this is sleep apnea. It's just a different flavor than the kind that tends to drive obvious detectable excess in strokes and heart attacks and cancer, okay? The empowered approach is to say that there may be reasons to treat this case of sleep apnea, but risk doesn't really seem to be one of them, okay? So we're talking about this risk. So she would be in here, she's in the referent uh, population, okay? This is not a reason to treat. Let's talk about Sophia, 72 years old, sleeps poorly, up to the bathroom on my AHI 44. So her AHI is high, okay? By the Wisconsin sleep cohort standards, um, we would be tempted to call this, quote, severe sleep apnea. We're tempted to use these data as a bludgeon to convince her to use the treatment we believe in, Okay. The empowered approach is to deconstruct that AHI understanding that there are many moving parts. So this is a home sleep apnea test hypnogram. This is one of the things that you can look at. This is her oxygen saturation, okay? This is a fictional case, of course. I use this as an example, but look at this up and down of O2, okay? Look at all these hypopneas. Look at all these obstructive apneas, okay? So what we see is that the supine AHI is 50. The non-supine AHI is six, so a lot of this is positional. And in the non-supine position, we see some mild upper air resi resistance features, but in the supine position, this is what we're seeing, okay? So all of these hypopneas, these are, this is open mouth breathing, I guarantee it. You can't get this volume through just your nose on recovery breathing. And these are central hypopneas. There is no snoring going on. We're seeing up and down of O2 saturations. These are, upper airway resistance features upon which is superimposed central apnea physiology. So if we were to put her in a sleep lab and we choose to, on the sleep lab study, we're gonna see that this recovery breathing is associated with periodic limb movements of sleep. Oh, by the way, it's worth reporting she lives at 5,200 feet. 
She's normotensive. She uses no medication and her BMI is 22. Okay. So what do we say about her risk? So there's many moving parts to sleep apnea. Okay. So for her, yeah, maybe her arousal threshold's low. Okay. Uh, she's got a narrow craniofacial respiratory complex. She doesn't breathe well through her nose. She often uses the open mouth breathing posture and her head position is forward and she's older, you know, so she's got a lot of check marks in the obstructive um, moving parts. She's not heavy, obviously BMI is 22, but how do you measure that or that? But the, the restless legs that she describes, you know, she describes restlessness in her legs. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but that's associated with a lower arousal threshold. She tends to breathe through her mouth. She lives at a high altitude. So she's got a lot of moving parts for um, central apnea physiology too. Someone out there has their microphone unmuted and I can hear you. I'm sorry. Um, now, when we go to the second reason to treat, when we talk to Kate about this snoring, okay, I built this monument, which included these illustrations to kind of try to give it some gravitas. But Kate wasn't sure if she snores because she sleeps alone. So we decided to do a little sleuthing, okay? Snoring is trauma, right? It's not just whether it bugs somebody. So Kate notices that she wakes up feeling stuffy and congested. She has pressurized eardrums. She has seasonal sinus infections. And when we, when we, we collect some data from the Snore Lab app, which is an app you can do on your iPhone, we were shocked to hear that Kate is really making a lot of noise. So when she thinks about this, she's now more aware of waking up with a dry mouth and with nasal congestion. So now she sort of considers these factors under the snoring reason to treat, okay? So that's Kate. We talked to Sophia. She doesn't think she snores. She stayed with friends who report that she breathes really loud. There's not a lot of rattling noises though. She admits that she breathes with her mouth open a lot because she senses she's not getting enough air through her nose. We decide to talk about the noisy mouth breathing. And, and we lump this in with the snoring concept as a possible reason to treat. We use this moment to talk about the functional importance of nasal breathing over mouth breathing. And we put in a pin in the idea that this may be something we can work on, okay? So that, again, the conversation is a, a process of, of discovery, of co-discovery. So what about the third reason, which is the sleep experience? So Kate is really not satisfied with her sleep. She gives herself a four out of 10, which is a clue that she's suffering. Okay. And one of the biggest reasons is she gets to bed at 10 and she can't get to sleep. Okay. Usually it's like 1 a.m. or later that she, she's tossing and turning. She's always got this negative self talk about how she's going to suffer tomorrow. So it, it feels light stage or poor quality. And, uh, and, and uh, she has uh, several awakenings throughout the night. She has a rise time that's delayed uh, and she sleeps in late on weekends. Um, so, in terms of her wake experience, she has non-restorative sleep. She feels bad in the daytime. She's distracted and irritable. So there's reasons there. And for Sophia, the sleep experience, she's not satisfied. And her legs are jumpy before sleep. They jerk her awake sometimes. She has to get up and walk before she goes to bed. Most nights, sleep feels poor quality and light stage. She's up a couple of times to urinate. And she doesn't dream. Her sheets are all over the place in the morning. For the daytime wake experience, this is also a problem. Okay, Low energy, chronically run down doesn't go out with friends. So there's a functional impairment, an hour long lap and, and nap in the afternoon. As far as comorbid, comorbid conditions go, um, these are situations or vulnerable comorbidities that untreated sleep apnea could make worse. So we talked about the ADHD symptoms. Is that a diagnosis or a symptom? We don't know. Nocturnal bruxism has been mentioned to her by a dentist because she's got a parafunctional wear pattern in her molars and bruxism is actually symptomatic. We get that she's got soreness in her jaws and bitemporal headaches. You know, for Sophia, she's thin and fit. She doesn't have any medical diagnoses. She's one of those people from Pavlova's paper from Harvard. She takes no meds. She's normotensive, but she does meet the diagnostic criteria for restless leg syndrome. Bigger uh, diagnostic uh, label is willis Eckbaum disease. Bigger topic we can get into, but she's got another problem, okay? Restless leg syndrome causes periodic arousals from sleep, which is contributing to her central apnea physiology. Good God, folks. We've got to unpack this correctly. So, by the end of the five reasons to treat discussion, both the provider and the patient have a firmer grasp on the individual flavor of sleep apnea that's present and the why of treatment, okay? This is where we help our patient construct their narrative. So this is Kate's narrative. I don't know if I want to read this out loud, but you can verify with this with the patient. 
22 year old woman, original sleep weight complaints include nightly loud snoring, residual congestion and ear fullness, frequent difficulty initiating sleep with a perceived prolonged delay to sleep onset, persistent sleep restriction during the work week with non restorative sleep and daytime impairment symptoms. Okay, all these other symptoms. Here's what we found it was a 4% AHI of three per hour with evidence of probable unscored RIROs, okay? Likely representing RIRA predominant sleep apnea. Unifies this diagnosis for this patient. For Sophia, she's 72 years old, poor overall sleep satisfaction, six out of 10. Original sleep weight complaints included mild to moderate restlessness in the legs prior to sleeping interval, making her get up and walk around. Persistent sense of light stage, easily disturbed sleep. Occasional awakenings with the sense of her legs jerking, dry mouth and loud breathing. Persistent sense of non-restorative sleep with low daytime energy and an afternoon nap requirement. Her polysomnography revealed actually sleep disorder breathing with mixed characteristics when we looked at it. Okay, features of both obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea were present simultaneously. Her AHI was 44. You see how this language unpacks this in a much different way of severe sleep apnea, AHI 44. Okay, we can help the patient understand a bit better. So summing up, we talked about entering here with the narrative. Okay, sleep satisfaction in a shared language. It captures the sense of the patient's own experience and it deconstructs the complexity of the many moving parts and the jargon associated with the AHI. The five reasons to treat coffee hut discussion has as much to do with the coffee hut as the discussion. Okay, the headspace of this, the presenting it as a, a safe thing for people to consider as they consider their own reasons why they should move forward with a way to address this. It's deconstructing the complexity of why an individual can consider engaging um, in a way that they can actually get their heads wrapped around. So this is about the project. The whole project is designed to uh, teach these complexity deconstruction tools in a language that makes sense to everybody, including providers of all stripes and patients. The curriculum of, of the empowerment is available free to everybody in our podcast. It's our first five episode season. Uh, full transcripts are available for the hearing impaired. They have cartoons and everything. And of course, the beautiful blue book is something that you can use as a touchstone, as a conversation starter. It really is something that brings a lot of dopamine. It's fun to look at and talk about. Um, it goes in the waiting room. So the best way to support this uh, educational project financially is to uh, purchase the book, actually. All, all profits after charity or after expenses go to charity. And we're, uh, those are the partners that we're, we're partnering with. Of course, it's available to everybody. And like Crows Teaching Crows, we can all teach each other and that's where the language is. And uh, I don't think I've gone too far over time. That's the end. I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Oh, that's, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I think our Zoom was just kind of acting up a little bit. Sorry about that mic thing. Can you can you see me as well, too? There we go. I can okay. see you. I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hoping the majority of what I said was audible. Yes. And it was, it was wonderful. It's so much information and it's so helpful and it's so thoughtful. And it's just as healthcare professionals, I really think we all, I think it should be a required course actually to learn more about sleep apnea because we're screening for something that it's so difficult and we're not taught this in dental schools and you do such a wonderful job of unpacking it. And you can do it either by audio podcast or this course that we have coming up, whatever learning <laughs> style you have, um, oh, you know, this I've got one Oh. <laughs> I've got a hilarious question. question. Yeah, no, no, hilarious. <laughs> had Marcus Welby and yeah, ever been visited by a fuller brush man? Good Lord. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, forgive me. Uh, um, I think in cartoons and, uh, and that's hilarious. And to my knowledge, no. But, you know, a, as I was going through my journey of what am I going to do with my life? Um, my, my heroes were, you know, these impossible creatures like Hawkeye Pierce. I wanted to be like Hawkeye who could talk to his, his patients, like real people, but do real good things and save people. Like that's, that's who I wanted to be. And I had no idea what that even looked like. Like my mother was a history teacher. My dad was a school psychologist, you know, um, medicine was not really in our family. So I had to, uh, kind of figure out what that was going to look like. And somehow, um, the process of, of finding the language to talk about this very complex disorder, you, you get pushback from people for bizarre reasons. Like I went in with like a, you know, the white hat and the purest of hearts. And suddenly you're getting pushback saying, you're just trying to sell me a machine. And I'm like, no, you know, no, I'm really not. I'm really trying to sort of get you from point A to a point better, you know, and the machine is a tool is that, and that's all. So the language of this process is a recognition that this uh, label 
carries with it all kinds of baggage and expectations and and um and actually uh, people have preconceptions about what what they're going to experience and a lot of it is negative you know and i want to find a way to um talk about this disorder that focuses on the patient rather than the label so that the patient can deconstruct what that label means for them so that they can kind of know how to use the tools of the system the way it is right now, which is very fragmented and spread apart, but they can figure out how to navigate that system with language that will apply in every silo. That's what this Empowered Sleep Apnea Project is about. Um, this language works everywhere you want to use it. Well, I'm just going to push the book again because there's so many questions here that I was like, wow, the, you, how many chapters do you have in the book? 145? Right, yeah, I mean, they're very short. They're very short. <laughs> they're just, short. They're yeah. concise. Yeah. And there, there's so much information there. And you do such a beautiful job at explaining it all that, you know, it's it's really not the, uh, a, a one question answer, unfortunately, or else everybody would be well versed like you. Um, what age do you recommend a child has a sleep study? Wow, that you know that that is a subject of considerable debate. So and this is one of the things that I've learned on this journey is that if you ask different professionals that question, you'll start getting different answers. I think the American Academy of Pediatrics is is recommending uh, screening for sleep apnea, and um, and major dentistry organizations are recommending screening for it. the 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 devil is in the details. How do you screen for it, and what do you do? when you start to get signal. And, and so the narrative of the expansive orthodontia uh, uh, movement, um, which is something that is uh, growing, and I think with good reason, um, that narrative says the earlier, the better. So if we're seeing a kid that's breathing through their mouth, that is having trouble sleeping, that is having behavioral problems during the day, um, the, the breathing is an obvious consideration and the size of the oral vault matters. Okay. And so the, the, the language that you'll hear from many standard orthodontia offices is, is the language of the more established um, uh, American Academy of Orthodontia, which is not really vocal about uh, the potential harms of retractive orthodontia yet. So depending on the culture that you're dealing with, this may not be signal that they're tuned into yet. Okay. Again, this is how silos happen is that they can't really hear each other um, when, when this language has diverged so much. And then do you prefer overnight study versus a home sleep study? Oh, that depends on context. So home sleep right. apnea testing is now widely available and that technology can open up opportunities for treatment. So that's hugely important. But um, an in-lab study gives us more information. You know, so like the example of Sophia, we learned a lot about her central apnea physiology by doing her in-lab study because we could see that the leg movements were driving the um, the arousals, which was part of the moving parts of the central apnea. So once you recognize that, oh my gosh, this isn't just a genetic thing that happens to you because you have central sleep apnea. This is something that we can tinker with. You know, there are different parts of this and suddenly like the altitude is a problem. Maybe she needs to go to sea level. Maybe we need to just treat her restless leg syndrome, which may belie an underlying iron deficiency, right? Maybe this whole problem is iron deficiency and that's driving the restless legs and the, and the periodic limb movements, which is driving the central apnea physiology. Maybe that's the signal we should follow, right? That's unpacking complexity. And we certainly can't do it in the hour, but I wanted to basically just kind of do an overview. And if the slide comes up and I can't help but smile, honestly, it's yeah, very do it. distracting. Can you see the Pulmonot slide here? Um, I, shared? I am not seeing a shared screen right no. now. Okay, hold on. <laughs> So there we are. We have, um, there's so many different ways to get this message across and music is one of them. Uh, we love to share that and um, I'd love to have you uh, as my cohort in the, the Pulmonauts, but I wanted to share that we're actually going to be um, celebrating. Pulmonauts Dr. live. Yes, <laughs> Professor John Yu in an upcoming course that I wanted to get to in a minute, but I just wanted to showcase that other musical side of you, uh, being the musical director for the Pulmonauts and the chief mojo coordinator to really <laughs> um, share the message in another creative way of just empowerment by just through music, because it's a it's a word, it's a language everybody understands. So we have Dr. Gerald Simmons and Dr. Brian Hockle, and we have the, the whole gang here. We can't see Barry Raphael or Reza Movahead, 
and um and then we also have greg and samantha and um jennifer so it looks really like we excited got, we got another question am i allowed to answer that please do yeah because i don't have that screen open so go this ahead is, uh, oh my gosh they're they're showing up how cognizant are primary mm -hmm. care docs of how prevalent unrecognized osa and un associated disorders are and is there a willingness to screen adults so the prime the the um the climate of primary care is is very difficult my wife is a primary care internist their time is incredibly limited by all of the things they have to document in order to get paid and so adding a new screening uh tool for them to do is a burden so they are aware and so for patients who come in symptomatic um there is a, a strategy to uh to test and to try and deal but um, unfortunately, the environment is is so time limited, and their number of tasks that primary care is burdened with is really incredible. So this means that dentists are often the very first people that are going to recognize critically airway and breathing. You know, uh, got another question? How important? Yeah, how, how important early... and how? Okay. Go, go ahead, Lauren. No, no you go. How important and how good. early do you see diagnosable red flags in children? And should this decide what age we start checking an anatomy in the dental field? Okay, I wasn't um, uh, specializing in kids. I did see kids, but my 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 clinical um, expertise is in adults. But um, the point is, it's never too young to think about it. And children present with behavioral difficulties, and they will often present with non-desaturating disease. And so this underset, uh, because they have healthy lungs, so they'll have um, airway uh, events that are going to cause arousals from sleep that on standard screenings like high-res pulse ox, or maybe um, a, a study score with a 4% desaturation criteria, they'll be told it's normal. And so they can go through this rigmarole of getting labeled as normal. And then all of a sudden the discussion goes someplace else and they go completely off track for years. So the key is that before we sort of get into this discussion of sleep apnea, we recognize how complex it is and that we're all kind of prepared to take that apart. Um, Michelle Phillips says, where's my practice located? I'm in Boulder, Colorado, but I am currently not seeing patients. Uh, I am uh, I am reading sleep studies on the side, and I'm really trying to figure out how to how to teach this stuff because that clinically, this curriculum is the thing that I think was the most important for my patient population. And I simply couldn't do it one patient at a time anymore because I saw what happened when it wasn't taught. And so now I'm trying to do it on mass. So if y'all can help me spread the message, again, Empowered Sleep Apnea, you can support the project by buying a book. All profits go to charity. I'm like Paul Newman and the salad dressing. <laughs> right, exactly. You know? exactly. Once we meet expenses and we haven't yet, like, but <laughs> once once the project gets off the ground, like we're, we uh, we are partnering with charitable organizations. We want to put all of this back into education. Great. And tell us a little bit about this new course that we're uh, collaborating on together uh, Friday, February 23rd. Oh, I can't wait. This is a full day, you guys. So if this was an introduction, this is an absolutely a full day of empowerment language that helps deconstruct the complexity of sleep apnea within the larger world of sleep disorders and sleep medicine in a way that your patients can understand, that you can understand, and so everyone understands. And when that happens, that shared consciousness of that complexity something magic transitions you know the patients can actually help you and that's the weird thing about this investment in education is once the patients are aware of that complexity they become agents of their own recovery and then they can help you 24 7. they're like a medical assistant that you don't have to pay they work for you 24 7 to solve their own problems you know it's 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 magnificent well we have another question am i allowed to answer this Go Tigers. Yeah, absolutely. It says go Tigers. <laughs> I don't know how you want to answer that, Rar. <laughs> nice. Well, you know, uh, yeah, sure. I still have some affiliation for LSU. I love them. So go Tigers. Uh, I loved living in Louisiana. My, one of my favorite uh, things is my wife learned to make a, a world-class gumbo, and it's absolutely magnificent. <laughs> I love it. Wonderful. So it is a full day course. Um, the course is going to be $9.99. We do have a $200 discount just through our listeners today, who those who registered for this course. It's, so it's a $7.99 course, plus you get a free book. We really just want this course out there to really get the buzz that it will get and to really just spread the word. So we're kind of getting ambassadors here to help us along this journey at a really um, fair price. So please 
consider supporting um, Dr. McCarty and his empowered sleep, empowered sleep apnea crusade here. Um, we're really all Airway Avengers. So we all are offering 20% um, off the book as well with the code AHS Empower. So you can go to empoweredsleepapnea.com and we're going to extend that. I think through the end of the year, right? Because yep, it's the gift right. that keeps giving. Okay. So we're going to have it. It's a great book to give and to read and again, to have for your patients in their in their book, I'm I'm so excited about this project that you have, Dave, with the Children's Airway. Um, I love uh, this. Yeah, Airway First Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about what you have in store with them? Well, you know, I, I've always been opposed to trifle handouts. In fact, on my website, you can find me sort of taking aim at simplifying sleep apnea to a trifold. But so it's kind of ironic that we produced a trifold. But this this is the idea that. There is a way to unpack this complexity, and it's just something you can have in your office. So this is something that the Children's Airway First Foundation is printing at cost. So like I'm not making a profit on this. They're not making a profit. You buy them at the cost that they um, print them at, and you can have this resource so you can get into the five uh, reasons to treat. Um, it has them listed there. It's a way to talk about, well, here we are in the Bay of Narrative. We're not ready to talk about treatment yet. We have to establish this. So it's a way of guiding people geographically through this. The five-finger approach is another sense-making tool that's on the other side of the island. That's that's going to be introduced in our, in our larger frame of of reference in our larger our course you know so more than we can yeah. get into here but it's a way of unpacking non-specific sleep weight complaints understanding that it's not all the airway you know sometimes other stuff is going on and you don't want to over titrate your treatment chasing symptoms that are due to something else right and our friend uh, dr kevin boyd and faculty member he wants to know might you be addressing pediatric patients in your february course or mostly adults so i'll be addressing philosophy, basically, Kevin. Um, and that means that it, it will apply to pediatric patients too. Uh, it's the language that all of us should be sort of talking about, but I will be talking about screening tools and some of those will be pediatric. I'll be talking about um, uh, diagnostic tools and of course, putting the uh, sense to the, uh, the terms we use for sleep apnea, competing diagnoses, all of these things are still relevant for pediatric patients. So it's not pediatric centered. I'm not a pediatrician and my practice was never pediatric focused, but all of the problem solving tools are, are pertinent to people working with smaller humans. I the uh, five finger approach to three-year-olds specifically, that age group, could, you, could that be applied? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. of course, Wonderful. because, you know, Wonderful. when you when when a th when it's sleep apnea in the three year old, we're not talking. Usually we're not talking about sleep apnea that's going to uh, end that patient's life. Sometimes we are, though, like Down syndrome, you know, Pierre Robin syndrome, um, like th these different uh, uh, severe, quote unquote, sleep apnea phenotypes. Risk is part of that discussion. But for many of the patients that the, the dentistry world is seeing, that's not really the risk that we're talking about. These, this is not right heart failure risk. This is not stroke risk. This is, you know, is this kid going to develop wrong? And is this kid going to be like having problems at school? And so, you know, I think those would probably in the construct of the five finger approach, those would be um, in the reasons to treat, those would be uh, medical, psycho psychiatric, psychosocial, wherever you want to file it. You know, has this kid been diagnosed with ADHD? Well, then maybe it's in the psychiatric, psychosocial domain. Is this kid having wake-related complaints that hasn't been diagnosed yet? Well, then you'll discuss it in the wake domain. Okay, so there's no right way to do it. It's it's a it's a structure that both provider and patient can understand to the limits of their um, uh, integrative ability, but it's a, it's a, it, it is a structure, you know, that's the thing is that if, okay. if, if complexity needs a structure, we need something. And until something better comes along, this almost always works, you know, should Love we it. do something Love about it. this? And, and, and the, should we usually informs the aggressiveness of what we're doing too. Because, you know, if the, if the reason is my kid's impaired and they're having all these problems, well, how bad is that? And how much do we think this is the airway? And if we're getting a ton of signal that this is airway, we're probably going to be more aggressive because of the suffering that's related to that reason to treat, right? We have um, Dr. Brian Hockle with us, and we also have Dr. Bill Hang with us. Um, so oh my welcome. Goodness. I know this is part of their group. I wanted to see if I'm going to allow them to talk if they want to kind of chime in here. 
um, on this course, but um, we're so super excited that uh, you're, the AAGO is hosting this uh, really to honor uh, Professor John Mew, January 12th and 13th, but I'm so super excited that you're actually going to present a lot of the material um, live. So if those prefer live learning, then come see Dave and, and Professor John Mew. Yeah, this Arizona. is going to be great fun. And, and yeah. we're going to do, we're, we've got a Pulmonauts reunion in Arizona. We do. So I don't, part I don't of the here. We can go in a, and play that here um, from Professor John Mew. Can you hear that on the audio? I'm not hearing it. You might need to share your okay. audio. So anyway, we're just seeing some pictures here on the side note, but um, it's going to be a wonderful meeting. Uh, it's actually a $50 coupon code. I apologize for that, but it's still a great, a fair price. Um, and music and it's we're having a musical evening if you were at musical. Collaboration Cures <laughs> yes that is so clever D uh, Dr. Darren Ward came up with that so um that'll be the Friday on the 12th um and we it's everything is really uh at a at a really fair price and we hope you can can join us in in this wonderful celebration I don't know if you want to chime a little bit more about the content or if Brian if I can get him to come on and I don't know if you can hear me that. can you hear me Hey, Hi, Dr. Hawk. How are you? Hey, guys. Doing great. Yeah, yeah. Great presentation, yeah. Dave, as usual. And Thanks. yeah, I can't say enough good about how this meeting is going to go in January, having a combination of you and John Mew. And uh, John's about 94 years old. So if you've heard the legend or not heard the legend, this is a great opportunity to get to talk to him. Uh, even lay people are just fascinated. There's been this whole cultural lore built around what John and Mike Mew have done. And uh, he's it's it's a, a rare treat to get to see him here. And it's taking a lot to get him here from the UK. So please come and uh, greet him and take advantage of all his learning. He's sharp as a tack, even in his elderly age. So yeah, love to have you come. And of course, hear the music too. Music's going to be a little bit different from what we did in Orlando. If anybody heard us there, this is going to be a, a a great entertaining evening. Yeah, we're 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 pulling out the rock and roll chops this time. At least we're going to try. Yeah, we're really excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you so much for putting this together. It's a real treat um, for everyone in who is this passion to help people breathe, sleep, and thrive. So that's everyone on this call. So hopefully, um, we'll see the majority of people there to celebrate and to learn more. Um, so please consider joining that. That will be on your follow-up email. Thanks, Dr. Hockel, uh, for coming Thank on. Mm -hmm. and, and we also have our mini residencies with Dr. Mariah. We do have our uh, our 2024 uh, dates lined up for January, March, April, and June. So you can feel free and go visit the website. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I think everybody kind of knows our courses by now, but this is the adult mini residency. We have our dates up. So you can, again, visit our website to learn more about that, about um, removable expansion appliances and clear aligners with adults. And then our advanced courses go from there. I'd love to set up a call to learn more about an educational pathway that's appropriate for you and your office, um, including uh, Dr. Kevin Boyd's course is now available on demand, and he offers in-office shadowing as well, which I think is invaluable, um, as well as a, a private Facebook group um, for office hours. You can ask questions since it is on demand. So take a look at that. And again, feel free to set up a call with me. I'm happy to chat with anyone who's interested on um, an educational pathway that's good for them. We have our orthodontist. Uh, on faculty, Dr. Brett Christensen. He's been doing this for 30 years. Um, so if you want to learn again from him, it's it's a wonderful peer-to-peer -peer course on his techniques of over 30 years. Uh, he teaches that step-by-step. -step, so that's available on demand as well. And, and our TMD to ortho mini residency with Dr. Michael Gelb, again, available on demand. You have 30 day access and it's basically the prequel to orthodontic. So he's talking about the acute TMD patient, getting them comfortable and ready for ortho so they can enjoy that expansive orthodontics. And we have um, Brittany Sierra is with us. Hi, Brittany. Thanks for coming on. I'm excited because we're launching a kind of a, a, a new chapter in Mayo for AHS and we're calling it the School of Mayo because we're going to bring on a lot of guests and a lot of, we're going to grow this um, eventually, but we're going to start with you, Brittany. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you have in store for the School of Mayo? Yeah, I'm really excited. So we're launching our uh, 
revamped version of our introductory introductory to myofunctional therapy course. So for any healthcare professional, not just registered dental hygienists, but if we have physical therapists on here, speech language pathologists, registered nurses, anybody that's wanting to get into myofunctional therapy, we will have an on-demand option, but we also will have an eight-week live option where a lecture will drop every Wednesday, and then we meet live Monday nights for a Q&A from eight to nine. Um, we're also going to be offering on-site shadowing with myself. So feel free to come to Connecticut, spend a day with me and my patients. Um, you know, we'll go, we'll make sure that we have a good line lineup of patients, you know, new patient evaluations at different phases through their treatment. Um, you know, see the way that CT oral facial myology works throughout the day, functions and whatnot. Um, and I know that some myofunctional therapists strictly want um virtual practices. So I am also going to be offering virtual shadowing. If that's what you want to do, we can have you hop on our calls with our patients virtually um, and still be able to spend the day together and, you know, help you really launch those practices. Thank you, Brittany. I think it's a great service. So we just want to provide the solutions and um, you can see a lot of familiar faces here. Dr. McCarty will be at Airway Palooza. Oh, um, I'm so excited for this day. It's actually three months away. So I just, the room block is almost full. So if you're considering going, I would I would consider taking advantage of that room block at the Ritz-Carlton. The first day is pediatrics where we focus on um, pediatric growth and development. And then it's, the second day is really focused on adult uh, expansive ortho uh, when surgery is applicable, when not. So you can see the list here of who's who. Um, it's our second annual. The first one was sold out. So I don't see why this wouldn't be sold out. And we have global speakers as well well, such as Dr. Shireen Lim and Dr. JJ and uh, Sharon Moore will be joining us from across the pond. So we're super excited uh, for this event. And we do have payment plans for those who are interested. We don't want that to be a barrier. The room rate is really good. It's $3.59 at the Ritz. I'm so proud of that. So I worked hard on that one. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with everybody. Again, um, I was I would consider making a, a donation to Ch Children's Airway First foundation because they do provide uh, wonderful resources. So um, we're really happy to support that. So please consider um, that for your holiday giving uh, this year. And our good friend, Gerald Simmons, he just called me while I was talking. Um, I don't know if he was trying to get on, but I know he has his course, the Sleep Education Consortium, which is in uh, April, April 4th to 6th. Uh, Dave, you'll be speaking at that as well. So um, this is a really a wonderful conference that we really hope that you would consider attending where the medical and dental, it's a really collaborative approach and it's a really hands-on for dental sleep medicine. So um, if you have any questions, you can go to their website and the early bird discount is extended through December. So hopefully we'll see everyone there. There's a lot of there's a lot of things to visit. There's a lot of places yeah. to go. Um, we always love giving these free conversations. So again, as long as you register, we will keep showing up and we're going to show up now with Dr. Susan Maples. Uh, we'll kick off the new year, January 4th. This will be a Thursday night because Wednesday, uh, the next week, I'm going to be traveling to Arizona with the Pulmonot. So, um, so I had to change it to January 4th, a Thursday night, 8 p.m. So please mark that in your calendar. These are always free, um, free of charge, and you get a free CE. So we're happy to promote that. Dr. McCarty, thank you so much. This was really, really empowering. And I think it's just really raised everyone's curiosity about really how complex it is and that you can actually unpack it. So thank you so much for all you do. And we're so grateful that you're on this journey and this rabbit hole to just empower patients and providers. We needed you, and we are so happy to have you on board. I am so happy to be here. And um uh what is this code for ce did i miss it and i'm having a difficult time spinning um <laughs> <laughs> okay right, so good. i'll announce you don't need a code you just needed to be on for the full hour we take that into consideration for the ce so we have your attendance recorded just by zoom it does it for us so we don't need any special codes uh so you will get your ce if you were I, there's a certain amount of minutes i forget that agd requires so if you met that uh criteria you will get your ce certificate so no worries about codes or anything so right. it was a wonderful evening good to see you Brittany. happy right. holidays everyone yeah it's happy holidays month of giving Buy, Thank you, the book. buy the book, give yes. the book, support Dr. Dave McCarty in his endeavors because it will empower everybody and we very well could change the world. We can. Empowerment saves. Spread okay. the word. Good night, everybody. All Thank right. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye.